Suddenly the battle began. Alexander launched his attack. The Persian archers and infantry buckled in the face of his fierce onslaught. At the same time, Darius's mass of cavalry by the sea launched their assault. But Alexander had sent enough reinforcements to prevent that wing from breaking. As the cavalries had engaged, the Macedonian phalanx had begun its attempt to cross the shallow river. The banks and water were serious obstacles. The fighting became confused and desperate. The blood really flowed, for the two lines were so closely interlocked that they were striking each other's weapons with their own and driving their blades into their opponents' faces. It was now impossible for the timid and the cowardly to remain inactive. Foot against foot, they were virtually engaging in single combat, standing in the same spot until they could make further room for themselves by winning the fight. Only by bringing down his opponent could each man advance. But exhausted as they were, they were continually being met by a fresh adversary, and the wounded could not retire from the battle as on other occasions, because the enemy were bearing down on them in front, while their own men were pushing from behind. Alexander, having smashed the Persian wing by the hills, turned towards Darius. Persian infantry scattered before Alexander's charge, but Darius's personal bodyguard fought almost to the last man. The Persian king, believing his life to be in danger, turned and fled. The Persian army, as Alexander had predicted, lost heart and turned to follow. An army is at its most vulnerable in retreat, and in the ensuing confusion, thousands upon thousands of Persians were trampled underfoot by their own troops or cut down by Macedonians in bloody pursuit. Darius's tent, which was full of many treasures, luxurious furniture and lavishly dressed servants, had been set aside for Alexander himself. As soon as he arrived, he unbuckled his armor and went to the bath, saying, Let us wash off the sweat of battle in Darius's bath. No, in Alexander's bath now, remarked one of his companions. The conqueror takes over the possessions of the conquered, and they shall be called his. When Alexander entered the bathroom, he saw the basins, the pictures, the baths themselves, and the caskets all made of gold and elaborately carved, and noticed that the whole room was marvelously fragrant with spices and perfumes. He turned to his companions and remarked, So this, it seems, is what it is to be a king. Among the prisoners were Darius's mother, wife and children. They expected to be raped and killed, but Alexander informed them that on the contrary, they would receive the respect due to royalty. Then he concerned himself with his own men. By order of Alexander, all the dead were buried with their arms and equipment on the day after the battle, and their parents and children in Macedonia were granted immunity from local taxes. For his wounded, he showed deep concern. He visited them all and examined their wounds, asking each man how and in what circumstances his wound was received. 
uh, allowing him to tell his story and exaggerate as much as he pleased. First of all, it established him definitely as a very high-level commander. It might have been luck at this particular time, purely, but now he has shown himself as a commander of great flexibility and adaptability, capable of defeating an enemy many times his own size. It also brings out a side of him which we do not always stress, and that, of course, is the chivalrous nature of the man and the way he treated the Persian royal family. But that must be balanced, of course, against the total ruthlessness with which he pursued and indeed cut down many, many of the rank and file of the Persian army. So you can say he shows a chivalrous instinct towards very important people, but as far as destroying the enemy's army, his main purpose, that he is absolutely ruthlessly determined to achieve. From a safe distance, Darius sent a message offering all of his empire west of the river Euphrates in return for peace. Advised by his leading general Parmenio to accept, Alexander replied that if he were Parmenio, he would. But he was Alexander and would not. Instead, he methodically continued down the coast to finish off the Persian fleet by capturing their remaining Mediterranean ports. No city successfully resisted him. His opponents, unless they were politically valuable, were either crucified or sold into slavery. In northern Egypt, at the mouth of the Nile, he established a new port, Alexandria. Then he headed east to pursue Darius. He caught up with him at Galgamela. Darius had lost many of his finest soldiers at Issus and was at heart a beaten man. In the ensuing battle, Alexander defeated him once again there would be no further conflicts. Darius was murdered by his own officers. Alexander consolidated his victories by securing the loyalty of those he had defeated. Provincial governors kept their posts if they accepted his rule. Persian soldiers were drafted into the army. Babylon became his empire's capital. He encouraged his soldiers to marry Persian women. Masters, he declared, were not to feel superior to the mastered. In contrast to previous Greeks, whose attitude towards the Persians was one of contempt, Alexander showed considerable respect for them. He respected the royal women whom he captured at Issus, treating them with great chivalry so that they adored him for the rest of their lives. Darius's mother committed suicide after Alexander's death. But equally, more importantly, he exploited the Persian men whom he increasingly captured. He got them onto his side. He got the Persian nobility who could administer provinces onto his side. And through the nobility, he would get the lesser nobility. He would get the rank and file of the cavalry of the Persian infantry onto his, onto his side so that he could use them to control Persia in his own interests. Ale Alexander was not content with Darius's empire. He was still only in his twenties and thirsted after further exploration and conquest. His teacher Aristotle had taught Alexander that the world extended from Europe to India. His ambition would not be satisfied until all this known world was under his control. For the next five years he led his men ever further east, fighting as much against nature as the guerrilla warfare of hostile tribes. Every challenge was met with innovation and tenacity. Mountain strongholds were scaled using ropes Rivers were crossed on inflated animal skins. Nothing, and no one could defeat him. And all the while, as he ventured further from Macedonia, he never failed to secure his lines of supply, leaving in his path many more cities in his name. In 327 BC, aged 29, 
he crossed the mountains into India. Alexander's veterans now felt that they had been pushed too far. They were anxious to get home and enjoy their newfound wealth and status. These predominantly Mediterranean soldiers had never experienced a monsoon before and were disheartened by the continuous rain. He was forced to turn and march back to Babylon. Still restless, he began to plan new campaigns in Arabia and North Africa. But in June 323 BC, aged only 32, weakened by wounds, fever, possibly even poisoned, he suddenly died. He was brave and noble, but he could be ruthless and tyrannical. Even within his own inner court, those he suspected of treachery were put to death. Among them, his leading general, Parminio, and his personal historian. Despite this, he never lost the love and loyalty of his soldiers. They were willing to follow him almost to the ends of the earth. Alexander's ability to inspire men is a very, very important thing. But he took on his father's army, which was a totally professional, thoroughly well-trained army, with much more experience than he had. And he must have relied very heavily on their experience. So it is, as I say, difficult to assess. His main thing is his own personality, which could make men follow him, and his ability to make quick decisions. It's interesting how many... Later commanders regard Alexander as the great example in which they try to model themselves. Julius Caesar, for example, in particular. I wonder why that was. Well, from, in my opinion, first of all, it was the sheer size of his achievement. This huge empire carved out from a very small army all the way from Macedonia and Greece to the northwestern areas of India. It is simply a boggling concept. You only have to look at the map to see that. And secondly, I'm sure future commanders were fascinated by how young he was when he achieved all these great affairs. Caesar, I remember, bemoaned the fact that he was only beginning at 40 uh, to have a chance to make a mark upon his times, whereas, of course, Alexander was dead before he was 33. This has also fascinated the generals of the future. But at the practical level, I think they admired the way he had a grip on his men, the way in which he could control circumstances to a certain degree, or at least mould them into making a situation to his liking. After his death, Alexander's empire collapsed. But his legacy proved more durable. His conquests had opened the East to a flood of Western and Greek influence and the contact between cultures was to have a lasting effect on European and Asian civilization. While Alexander's faults have been largely forgotten, his extraordinary achievements have made him a figure of legend. For over 2,000 years, he has remained the first and foremost of the great commanders. <laughs>